this is part 3 of the series on the Mundak Upanishad. In our last session, we spoke about the symbolic meaning of the word Mundak. We also try to understand in greater depth the deeper meaning behind rituals and we try to understand the behavior of the wise. This session we will continue with chapter 2, canto 1. I am reading verse 1. It is the truth that just as a great fire manifests thousands of sparks that share its nature, so the manifold world evolves from the indestructible and is absorbed back into it again. We all know what a fire looks like. A really large fire also has many sparks. You see the sparks and you may have noticed that the sparks are nothing other than very small little aspects of the fire itself. They are no different from the fire. Just as the drop from the ocean has the same qualities as the ocean, so also the sparks are not different from the fire itself. The difference between this metaphor between fire and the ocean is that in the fire we see these sparks we see them manifested and then it seems they just vanish. They were there and then they were gone. And so it is with the individual souls that come forward from the universal soul. They live out their desires, they are manifested and then they seem to disappear. They are reabsorbed into the fire. We keep coming back to these metaphors and there is a reason for this. The reason being that this is the absolute fundamental truth. Each one may have his own particular favorite. This Upanishad speaks about fire. If you forget the name of this Upanishad, you can also call it the fire Upanishad. We spoke about it in the last session that this Upanishad comes from the Atharva Veda, which is the fourth Veda. And the Atharva Veda refers to Atharvans, and these are the fire priests. Their duties include taking care of the sacred fire not allowing it to be put out, all the ritual duties which go around it. It is a symbol of the great light within us. Any questions so far? Any comments or thoughts about this?
Okay, let's go to verse 2, 3 and 4. They are similar, so I'm going to club them together and read them together as well. Purusha, the Supreme Consciousness, is self-effulgent, formless and unborn. It pervades and permeates the entire external and internal world. It is beyond prana and mind. It is perfect and unalloyed. From this he was prana, life energy, the mind, all the space senses, space, air, fire, water and earth, which supports the whole world. Fire is the head. The moon and the sun are the eyes. The directions are the ears. The revealed Vedas are his speech. Air is his prana. This universe is his heart. Earth itself has emerged from his feet and he alone is the inner self of all living beings. Looking upon this verse, you see it begins with Supreme Consciousness that is formless and unborn. And it describes that this consciousness permeates everything, the internal as well as the external world. So everything is consciousness. There is nothing that is not really conscious. There may be a matter of degree, where some things are finer and have a very finer, subtler consciousness, and the others have a more gross consciousness. The finer, subtler consciousness is called shukshma, and this means subtle, it's very fine while the gross is called jada. It's gross and it refers to the more material aspects of our world. From this evolves prana. We also call this adi prana, the very first unit of life. And the nature of that is not different from pure, pure consciousness. Its nature is the same. Prana is consciousness. Only it is a more specific form. While consciousness is more general. It's universal. Prana is more specific. From this evolves prana, then mind then the senses, and then all the elements. These are what the world is made up of. Now, these two paragraphs may sound familiar to us. These two paragraphs are describing how the world evolves out of pure consciousness. Verse 4, which is a more mystical verse, referring to fire is the head, moon and sun are the eyes. Air is prana, universe is in his heart, is a description of the universal self. It's poetic, it's mystical. This is called Sandhya Bhasha. This is the way the ancients communicated things to individuals who may not have had a direct experience. Some of these direct experiences were so difficult to communicate that the practitioner or the adept had no choice other than to use very mystical language, which is called Sandhya Bhasha the twilight language.
this verse attempts to describe the universal self, we see the same attempt being made in the Bhagavad Gita as well. There, the description was a little bit more elaborate. But we see that essentially it is the same. It brings me to this idea which is so much a core of the Upanishads, the concept of neti neti, not this, not this. Whenever a student, a disciple, a practitioner asked the master, asked the teacher, how is that highest? How is pure consciousness? How do we how, it, how does it look? How does it feel? How is it experienced? Can you describe it? And when they asked, is it like this? And they said, not this, not this. Is it like that? Not this, not this. So any attempt to describe this universal consciousness, this Vishwarupa, always misses the mark. Not this, not this. So these verses describe the process of how this universe or this world as we know it expands out of consciousness and the universal consciousness itself is basically an expansion of the self. They both have the same nature. The drop and the ocean have the same nature. The spark and the fire have the same nature. Your individual soul or Atman is the same in nature as the universal self. There is no qualitative difference between the two. Any questions, thoughts, comments so far? It's a fundamental truth that is described here. And yeah. so it should actually not be different in other religions. If they all go back to the same source, then you probably be able to trace all these aspects which are described here also in other religions. Yes, indeed. That is true. The, the essential problem has been is that many other traditions and religions even though they have this there are not many practitioners there are a lot of scholars there are pundits there are people who read books bookworms but there are not enough people who practice we have religionists, they, they follow religions, there are ritualists who follow rituals, but there are very few who really understand the depth of this teaching through direct experience. It is this which has led to misunderstandings between these religions, between these traditions, and has led to many unfortunate uh, wars and... Uh, uh, terrible things but at the summit at that highest mountain where all paths meet 
there are no religions, there are no traditions, there are no rituals, there's only pure consciousness. There we are all one. If there would be people who would practice, it doesn't matter which from which tradition you come, for which path you take, it will lead you to the same summit. So it is said that if you practice, even if you come originally from another spiritual tradition or religious background, this will help you understand your own religion of birth. And so, yes, that is uh, a good question. It is available elsewhere as well. These are not the only scriptures and this is not the only tradition which uh, talks about this fundamental truth. But it is unfortunate that there are very few who practice. And we get lost in these words, this technical jargon, this kind of um, intellectual understanding of things and then it all gets confused and muddled up. If we would simply practice, it would all be very clear. Yes. And you can even take it one step further when you say that it's not only true for all religions, then on this planet, then it should be also true for all other life forms in the whole universe. It's a kind of a very um, astonishing thought. Yes, I guess so, yes. Yeah. So verse 5, having the sun as its source of energy, fire evolves from him. From him also evolves Soma, the second stage of fire. From Soma comes rain and from that all the herbs that grow on the earth. Just as a man plants a seed in a woman, and thus life ensues, so with the aid of Purusha do numberless beings evolve. This verse is once again a very mystical verse. This is Sandhya Bhasha, the twilight language. It is called the twilight language because it is a sim symbolizes the meeting of the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon, the wedding of the sun and the moon is when both the conscious and the unconscious mind are integrated and there's a great deal of awareness and the practitioner has now access not only to the conscious mind, but also to the infinite energies of the unconscious mind. Such a highly evolved soul or adept sees the world differently. That is why we say darshan, to see. And we call such adepts also seers. And they see things differently and as I mentioned already, they struggle to describe these things and therefore they use Sandhya Bhasha. This verse is describing that which takes place after the Arjuna Chakra has been pierced. When the practitioner goes beyond this sixth chakra, he pierces the Brahma Granthi, the last Granthi or the last knot. Then 
the practitioner is reborn. It's called the second birth, the twice born. He experiences that fire which is within. The sun, which is referred to here, is the Manipura chakra. It's a source of a tremendous amount of energy. And when this has been activated, we can pierce the Ajna chakra and experience the fire, the inner fire. This fire is the fire of knowledge, of inner knowledge, of wisdom. It's not knowledge as in book knowledge, intellectual knowledge, but it is far deeper and so we can say it is the fire of wisdom. Obviously, there is no real fire within. This is the Guru Chakra. This is where one surrenders one's thoughts, deep emotions, memories, and becomes free from the bondage of samskaras and karma. When we are able to burn these in the fire of awareness, then we experience this beautiful bliss. It's like having drunk some incredible nectar. Amrut or nectar was also known as soma. It's a wonderful nectar. And it is referred to as a nectar of immortality. Because having tasted that, one becomes immortal. This immortality is not a reference to physical immortality. Often, those who have read the scriptures, especially the Mundak Upanishad, have read about Soma and thought it's a kind of a plant or herb and for many, many centuries, people, especially in India, have been searching for this legendary Soma plant. Nobody has found it because it is the Soma within which is being referred to. It is this nectar which gives us bliss which brings us in touch, the finest part of the self. It's like being intoxicated. And when we drink the Soma and this knowledge and wisdom, this divine wisdom is integrated comes rain. This is one of the final stages where you ascend to the seventh chakra, the Sahasrara chakra. The opening of this is marked with a change in the biochemical structure of your body. The entire biochemistry is perceived by the adept to change. Person is transformed to a very divine being, pure being. And the initial experience is like a shower or like a rain. Yoga Sutra speaks of the Dharma Megha Samadhi. Megha is rain. The rain of dharma is purifying you and the herbs that grow, the plants that grow 
are a symbol of nurturing. Such a person nurtures others, serves others, and acquires a great deal of knowledge or wisdom intuitively also of healing. These are the true healers. Healers are different from healing practitioners. Doctors, Ayurvedic therapists, therapists of other alternative medicines, these are healing practitioners. I use this term, this term to indicate that they may have studied medicine or their particular branch of healing or healing uh, science, but they do not have that intuitive wisdom as yet. They are not really healers in the true sense of the word. Healing practitioners may help to to manage the disease or the body, but healers transform at the level of the mind and the spirit itself, take away the root of the disease to heal. So a very beautiful, very, very mystical verse with a great deal of symbolism in it in Sandhya Bhasha. These higher chakras and the knowledge of it is also known as Brahma Vidya or Madhu Vidya. Madhu means nectar. means honey and it is referring to that direct experience of bliss it is also called amrit or nectar and this is the knowledge of the secret chakras which are beyond the Agya Chakra and before the final chakra itself, which is the Hasrara Chakra. And the knowledge or the experience of this is what completely transforms a practitioner out of a child or a fool becomes a wise seer. If you may recall, in the last session we said that there are two categories of fools. The first category is those who think they know, already know everything, and it was referred to as the blind, the blind leading the blind. So, first category, and the second category, is like children. So if the blind fool and the child would meditate and experience this inner fire and drink from this somarasa, this nectar of immortality, he would be reborn and become a wise sage or a seer and this is Madhu Vidya also called Brahma Vidya also called Shri Vidya they are all the same Are there any questions or 
thoughts on this verse? I will read now from verses 6, 7, and 8. <clears throat> from him also come forward the mantras of the Rig, Sama, and Yajurvedas, the knowledge pertaining to initiation, rituals, the sacrifices, and the concept of giving offerings. From him also develops the units of time, such as the year and the month, and the aspirants who strive to perform rituals, as well as the whole world, which is purified, illuminated, and sustained by Soma and Surya, fire and the source of fire. From him evolve manifold celestial beings, evolved, being, evolved souls with full awareness of their goal, human beings, animals, birds, prana and apana, all kinds of grains, tapas, faith, truth, discipline of mind and senses, and many other rules and laws. From him evolve the sevenfold pranas, the seven flames, the seven fuels, seven kinds of offerings in the sevenfold universe, residing in the cave of the body, the heart, the sevenfold pranas continue their journey. From these verses, we understand that the universe is an expansion of the individual self and it includes Vedic knowledge, scriptures, rituals, all this life which existed at that time. So it is describing life at that time. Naturally, if a seer would write today the Vedas, he would describe it differently. In those days, the highest knowledge was the ritual knowledge, the knowledge of the Vedas. So the Vedic knowledge was referred to. It's referring to astrology as well. It was this cosmology was very important to those who lived in nature. This is not just true of India or the Vedic period. But throughout the world, until the advent of technology, especially electricity, people lived in sync with nature, day and night. Today we have electricity, so we do not, it does not matter if it gets dark, we just switch on the light. But previously, there were no street lights. It got extremely dark. The moon had a different relevance to your daily life. So, the sun and the moon, these sources of light, were extremely important. And whole life moved in rhythm along with these two celestial bodies. In the external world, one moved together with the celestial bodies, but the internal world is, was sustained by the two internal bodies, Soma and Surya. Fire and Soma also means moon. So, sun and moon, the internal sun and moon. It 
describes here the different aspects of this universal self. There are different layers or planes of consciousness. So we had highly evolved beings right at the top, the subtle most level of consciousness. Then came celestial beings. Then those humans who were highly evolved and they came or were born with awareness of their goal. Few of us know what our goal is in life. And that is why we must always work towards understanding ourselves, getting to know ourselves. Only evolved souls attempt to understand the purpose of their life and work towards fulfilling that purpose. They may have goals, they may have a larger purpose, a bigger purpose, and they work towards that. The rest are not as evolved, but they have a human body, so they are human beings. They are animals and other beings, all at different levels of consciousness. All this is a part of the universal self, including all the disciplines and rules and the laws, society, all this is a part of universal consciousness. Nothing is excluded from it. The sevenfold pranas or the seven flames, these are all familiar to us under another name and that is the seven chakras. The sevenfold universe or the seven chakras are nothing other than the planes of consciousness. At the bottom of the ladder are the less evolved beings. They are not very conscious. They have consciousness, but they are not conscious. They are not aware. They are not aware of themselves, that they exist, that they are beings. There is a sense of tamas. Then come the more rajasic beings, and human beings are more rajasic in nature. We are aware of ourselves and we are striving to develop. And that natural process of evolution is happening. And then at the highest, the more divine beings who are already very evolved, which may be the siddhas or highly evolved beings who know the purpose of their life. So, the seven chakras are the planes of consciousness and we human beings can be also very tamasic in nature, very animal-like. If that is the case, then we are very identified or stuck at the lower chakras. Those who are slightly more evolved, they are at the higher chakras. This is a vast study on its own and the one who practices, meditates, does advanced pranayama begins to get a direct insight and a comprehensive understanding of the chakras. It's become fashionable to talk about chakras and there are people who are talking about raising their kundalini and these things. Most of these people are very ignorant. They do not have a deeper understanding about these. They have read these from books, learned a few techniques. But practicing techniques is not the same as having direct experience and having a comprehensive understanding. 
This is what mastery is about. Having access to the unconscious mind and being able to channelize its power. Some of us have unconsciously gained access to the unconscious mind, creative people, for example, but we do not know how to channelize this. That is why many great creative minds were disturbed and burnt out very fast. We only have to think about famous, some famous actors, musicians, artists. They were not able to sustain that fire and that inner fire burnt them, you can say, because they did not have mastery over it. It's like lightning. It is extremely powerful but very dangerous and you have to learn to master it. Any questions? on the description of the universe from a yogic perspective. I will read verses 9 and 10. From this supreme being spring the various oceans, mountains and rivers and all the earths. Within all this resides the inner self. This whole universe is the expansion of Purusha alone. Tapas, knowledge and its result manifest from Brahman. And ultimately, consciousness is the essence of all that exists. He who knows Purusha, residing in the cave of the heart, destroys the knot of ignorance here in this lifetime. This sums up the core idea, which is that the world is within us, and this world is also an expansion of us. Both are true. You can see it whichever way you like. You can see this world as if it is within you, within the drop. You see the universe in the drop. Or you see the universe as an expansion of the drop. Both are true. The microcosm is equal to the macrocosm. There is no difference. We just do not see it in our daily life. If we would know this directly, the knot of ignorance would be destroyed in this very lifetime. It is possible to know the essence of all, that is pure consciousness, to know it directly, to experience it. This may sound theoretical right now, that's okay. We just contemplate on it, let it sink in and when you continue to do your practice, keep unlearning deep-rooted habit patterns and learn to unlearn, then the greatest progress and insights will come. Merely practicing some techniques is not enough. 
That's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. That is the difference between learning and unlearning. To understand this and to get the direct experience of this, it is absolutely essential that one unlearns. Unlearning is just another way of saying putting all your samskaras in the fire of awareness, piercing the Ajna Chakra. Remember, that the Ajna Chakra is not the chakra of knowledge. Quite contrary to what a lot of people believe, it is not the chakra of knowledge. It is the gateway to the chakra of knowledge. That is why it is called Ajna Chakra. Jna is knowledge and A is negation, not knowledge. So this chakra does not give you knowledge. It's only piercing it and going beyond that one acquires this inner wisdom, this rebirth. It is a gateway. It's a gate which protects the higher chakras from the unworthy. It's like a fence. A very, very high fence. Any questions or comments to this two verses or even to any of the other verses? Perhaps everybody is drunk the Soma Rasa and is now intoxicated on this divine nectar. I will continue in that case to read chapter 2, canto 2, verses 1 and 2, or was there a question? Radhika Ji? Yes. Hello. I, I wanted to ask if, if you can expand a little bit on the goal as used here, um, like encompassing worldly goals or spiritual goals or everything? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. This is actually a fabulous Upanishad because we know from part one, our very first lecture, that the perfect householder, Shavnak, approaches a monk. So we have both. We have a renunciate and we have a householder, which indicates that this Upanishad and these teachings, these highest teachings of the highest chakras and wisdom is not a privilege only of renunciates, but is also for those who are perfect householders, who know how to live in the world yet above. This tradition is therefore a very fine tradition, it does not exclude anyone. And the goal is not to retreat from life, to run away, it's not an escapism. So, if your desire is very intense, 
You can renounce, you can do tiaga, you can say, I'm not interested in anything else. But you can be in the universe and achieve the same end. And that implies you can have both. In a way, you can say, you can have your cake and eat it too. Or you can have samadhi and eat, have, experience it too. So, both you can have, the world as well as this highest wisdom. You do not have to escape from anything. And therefore the goals are to understand oneself first, to gain that comprehensive understanding. Only when you know yourself, do you really understand your dharma, what your real nature is? And only when you know what your real nature is, can you really know how to lead your life. If you do not know yourself, you are like bumbling in the dark. You don't know what you're doing. You are generally just following and doing what your, the world around tells you to do. Society tells you you should aspire to be something. Your family tells you become such and such thing. And then you're trying to, to do things which maybe you do not really want deep within. So you need to understand yourself. The basic goal of one, it doesn't matter whether he is a renunciate or a householder, is first and foremost to know yourself. And when you know yourself, everything else falls into place. So would you say if, if I were to make the statement to must know your real nature to channel your unconscious effectively to realize your goal? Yes. Yes. You need to know both conscious as well as your unconscious aspects so that you can channelize these energies towards your goal or purpose of life is better. So, so channeling, channeling your unconscious energies is not the same as sort of doing the, um, whatever they call the siddhis and, and so on. Yes, it is. Uh, you are able to channel, cha channelize the unconscious, the power of the unconscious mind. Oh, okay. And, and sort of that's okay. Yes, and consciously, as I mentioned, that the... I just have to uh, mute you, Manisha, because otherwise I'm hearing my, my echo myself. <laughs> so, um, yes, it is... It is accessing the power of the unconscious mind consciously. As I mentioned, it is not uncommon for creative people to be able to access the unconscious mind. As a musician, artist, writer, poets, actors, all those who are in the creative field, they are able to do this and unconsciously. You may have all heard of the painter Salvador Dali. He used to do something very strange to make his paintings. If you have seen his paintings, very surrealistic paintings. And they look like dreams. The reason is that he actually used to keep waking himself up with the alarm clock. So he would write down the moment he got up the dream he remembered. Now, he was basically trying to channelize his unconscious mind and trying to use unsystematic methods in order to gain access to the unconscious mind. Creative people have different methods. Everyone is different. They have their own methods. But the yogi has a systematic approach to understand the unconscious mind and channelize this huge power which is said to be like lightning. Imagine the power of lightning. This is so amazing. One flash of lightning can, I think, 
I don't know the exact figures, but can light up a huge city or provide electricity to a huge city for a whole day. So imagine the amount of energy which is there. But can we channelize the power of lightning? No, we cannot. We don't know how to do that because it is very unpredictable. It just happens somewhere. Even if we study the weather and we know there's going to be a thunderstorm, we are still not able to channelize this lightning because it strikes very unpredictable. We don't know where it's going to strike. And that's the methods which are used by creative people. They are playing with lightning. It's very random. But the yogi has learned how to channelize this energy, which is a bit like saying that the yogi has got access to a nuclear reactor. He has learned how to take that amazing energy and has ways of channelizing it. It's dangerous, but he has things under control. And that is something he can do consciously. And that is an adept, is somebody who then acquires what we, normal people, ordinary people, would call Siddhis. Actually, it is just normal evolution. A child might wonder how the adult can do all these amazing things that the child cannot do. And you think, okay, that the, the adult thinks, yes, okay, it's all obvious it can be done, that you know that the child will also evolve and get there to some, at some stage. But most humans are like children. We can call these siddhis. They are not from a perspective of a adept. They are not siddhis. They are just the natural fallout of acquiring access to the unconscious mind, which is not without its dangers. Therefore, the emphasis on guidance. Okay. So I hope that was useful. I still have a question or comment from Sri Ram. These verses are descriptions of higher and higher states. What is the intent of these verses? Is it meant to inspire? Or is this useful for someone who practices? Well, there are not many people who are practicing. And what the intention behind it is, I can only guess that this knowledge should not be lost. Though there was a danger of missing, all the same, this knowledge should not be lost. But also keep in mind that these scriptures were not available to everybody. They were guarded by the lineages. This particular Upanishad was part of a lineage called the Shavnak Shaka, the school, the Shavnak school. And they were custodians of this Upanishad. This is Upanishad of our tradition. So the teachings that the teachers of our tradition hand down to the students are related to these scriptures and through the practice and through the guidance you learn to interpret these as well as then get direct insights for yourself. Those who are not a part of that lineage or tradition may study them intellectually. And we have seen many German and British scholars and, and lately American scholars who attempt to translate these from the Sanskrit make very intellectual translations. There are verses which will follow where 
the scholars would say, oh, this makes no sense. What is this about sun and moon? And, and they, they find this mystical and cryptic and the translations are therefore very poor because they are not really based on guidance from a teacher. They are purely theoretical. So I guess that the scriptures are in fact were kept secret and were handed down only to those who were worthy. Today, since they are available to everybody, uh, there is an urgent need for correcting some of this misinterpretation. It is wonderful that adepts like Swami Rama and others who are now also able to write in English have translated as well as written commentaries on this. Earlier, this was done by Western scholars because the Indians at that time, especially those who were practitioners and adepts, did not have access to English language. And many of them also did not translate simply because they were not interested in that. They were focusing on practice. They were focusing on their small little group of seekers, intense seekers. So Madhu Vidya is indeed one of the highest scriptures describing the highest chakras and highest states. It probably is also inspiring for those who read or have access to the genuine and authentic interpretations. If you do not have access to genuine and authentic interpretations, it can be just very confusing, I can imagine. But otherwise, it is very inspiring. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this session. We will continue next Friday with Chapter 2, Counter 2. And... We will continue to, to understand the wisdom of Madhukvidya.